Um, it's been a couple weeks now. I have had such an issue with my phone, so I'm sorry I'm here now, and I really hope you enjoyed today's video. It has taken me like almost a month to do because of my phone, so oh, cannot wait to post this. Today's video is going to be about the serial killer, another Alaskan serial killer, Israel Keys. I had never heard of him before and I was quite surprised because of his crimes and the way he went about it that he had, didn't have more media coverage. So let me know if you have heard about him. Um, comment below. Especially watch this video and let me know what you think about him. He's referred to the modern day Ted Bundy and the most modern day serial killer. I've also included some of the interview footage. Oh, just wait, it will give you chills. If you also haven't checked out my Robert Hansen, who is another Alaskan serial killer, I will link it down below. Definitely go check it out. Also, if you head over to my Instagram and stuff, you can interact with polls and I ask questions and stuff. And you can DM me questions for my Q&A that I'm gonna be hosting when I hit 200 subscribers or just comment questions down below. Keep telling me cases to cover. I've gotten so many and I'm so excited to do them all. Please subscribe and keep watching for more. <laughs> Plus, the taxpayer is a lot of money. Who was Israel Keys? He was an American criminal who confessed to being a serial killer, rapist, arsonist, burglar, and bank robber. The FBI believe he is responsible for multiple kidnappings and murders across the country between 2001 and 2012. The FBI believe there are 11 victims. His early life. Keyes was born in Richmond, Utah in 1978. He was raised in a Mormon family and was homeschooled. His family moved to Aladdin Road area, north of Colville, Washington, where they became neighbors and friends with the Kehoe family. Israel Keyes was childhood friends with Chevy and Shane Kehoe, known racists and white supremacists who were later convicted of murder and attempted murder. Chevy Kehoe serving three consecutive life sentences for the kidnapping, torture, and murder of William Muller in his family. He's occasionally attended a Christian identity church, which had racist views. Eventually, however, Keyes rejected religion entirely, identifying as an atheist. Keyes served in the U.S. Army from 1998 through 2000 at Fort Lewis, Fort Hood, and in Egypt. He started a construction business in 2007 in Alaska, Keyes Construction, working as a handyman, contractor, and construction worker. He also took care of his daughter and his girlfriend. Keyes was a very methodical planner. He would set up and bury up to three different types of kits slash caches. They were murder caches, cash, and souvenirs from the victims. They were all somewhere in the targeted area, stashing items like shovels, plastic bags, zip ties, money, weapons, ammunition, and bottles of Drano to decompose the bodies. He buried the kill caches in states so he could go back and kill and dispose of the bodies in an organized fashion. His murder kits have been found in Alaska and New York, but he had admitted to having others in Washington, Wyoming, Texas, and possibly Arizona. This is a homemade brass catcher that he made, so this would catch any of the spent rounds coming out of his um, weapon, so he wouldn't leave the evidence behind. He would look for victims in remote areas like parks, campgrounds, walking trails, or boating areas. If he was targeting a home, he would look for a house with an attached garage, no car in the driveway, no children or dogs. Keyes was very smart about planning his murders. He planned ahead, he bought everything in cash, he would turn off his phone so nobody could really track him. He said he traveled from state to state for the sole purpose of committing murders and that he targeted everyone from old couples, young people to young women. This was so nobody could link him and it didn't look like the murders linked. He would rent cars and drive thousands of miles to the location he wanted to kill. He would not fly to the exact area as he knew that could possibly link him. As soon as the murder was over and committed, he would leave the area immediately. The earliest crime to which Keyes admitted to was an abduction and rape of an unknown teenage girl in Oregon, sometime between 1996 and 1998. His first victims were in Washington State. In the late 1990s, Keyes admitted to investigators that he killed four people in Washington state. He's lived in several places in that area from the late 1990s 
until about 2008. He realised that he would need to move as people might start to link him. He needed somewhere remote. He decided Anchorage, Alaska. He made a rule that he could not commit a murder in the state that he lived in, therefore making him travel to other states to commit his crimes. Keyes has also claimed to have killed a woman in April 2009 in New Jersey and buried her near the Tupper Lake in upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, just well, it sounds it. like they've got it. They've got the area. They just got to find it. Keyes did not have a felony criminal record in Washington, although he had been cited in Thurston County in or near Olympia for driving without a valid license and, in an earlier incident, pleaded guilty to driving under the influence. He confessed to at least one murder in New York State. Authorities have not determined the identity, age, or gender of the victim, or when or where the murder may have occurred, but they do regard the confession as credible. Keyes has ties to New York State. He owned 10 acres in a run-down cabin in the town of Constable. To fund his crime and to make sure that he could pay everything by cash, Keyes also confessed to bank robberies in New York and Texas. The FBI later confirmed that Keyes robbed the Community Bank branch in Tupper Lake, New York in April 2009. He also told authorities that he burglarized a home in Texas and set it on fire. Keyes was also linked to the deaths of Bill and Lorraine Courier of Essex, Vermont, along with his confession. Authorities do say they have enough evidence to link Keyes to the murders. The Vermont couple was last seen after leaving work on the night of June 8, 2011. Keyes came upon the courier's home a little after midnight after walking on foot from his nearby hotel. He cut the couple's phone lines, broke into the home's attached garage, and soon made his way into the kitchen in what he called a blitz attack that only took a matter of seconds. Keyes made his way to the couple's bedroom where he found Bill aged 50, and Lorraine, aged 55, asleep. The couple woke up to see a man dressed in all black wearing a headlamp armed with a gun. He tied the couple up with zip ties and quizzed them on the details of their home, including whether they had a safe, where the ATM cards were, and whether or not they had a gun. Keys took their handgun along with their cell phones and then forced the couple to get into their own vehicle before driving them to an abandoned home he scouted out earlier. Once there, he tied Bill to a stool in the basement, whilst he left Lorraine behind in the car. When he returned, he found Lorraine had escaped from the front seat and was trying to run to the main road. Sadly, he tackled her and dragged her into a bedroom of the home, tying her arms and legs to the bed. When Keyes went down to check on Bill, he discovered that he had also worked himself partway free. Keyes would later tell investigators during his confession that that really annoyed Keyes as he had a very specific way that he wanted things done and that he had the whole thing planned out. After discovering Bill had altered his plans, Keyes told the investigators that he just lost control and struck him with a shovel repeatedly before taking out a gun and fatally shooting him multiple times. Keyes returned to the bedroom where he cut Lorraine's clothes off with a knife and raped her twice. During this sexual assault, Keyes strangled Lorraine to the point where she had lost consciousness. Then he brought her to the basement to see her husband's bloody corpse. After sitting her down on the bench, he strangled her from behind with a rope, ending her life. Keyes doused the bodies with Drano, then tossed them into a corner of a basement, covering them with the breeze, before he left. Keyes took the couple's car to a car park which he had already left his rental car and switched vehicles before driving off. Bill and Lorraine's bodies have still never been found. This case left investigators baffled as they had little to go on except for a broken window. Two years prior to Bill and Lorraine's deaths, Keyes had hit a murder kit near their home, which included a handgun and various other supplies. Keyes did use the supplies during the murder of the couple. After the murders, he moved most of the items to a new hiding place in New York. Keyes' last known murder was the kidnapping and murder of 18-year-old Samantha Koenig, a barista working in Anchorage, Alaska. Keyes had made a remark about how he had broken one of his own rules, and that's why he got caught. 
Authorities said that Keyes kidnapped her from her work. He had observed the coffee bar over a few days. He did this after considering other coffee stands, but chose common grounds because of the location and it was open later than other coffee stands. Samantha's abduction was caught on video and a massive search for her was conducted by authorities, friends and families for weeks. During the robbery and abduction, Keyes said to Samantha that he had a police scanner in his ear and that he would be able to tell if she hit an alarm and if she did, he would kill her. As Keyes led Samantha through the parking lot, he found a new Canon camera on the ground. It had to be worth about $300, he said. He bent over to pick it up and Samantha, feeling his distraction, took away and ran. Keyes regained control of Samantha quickly by pressing his twenty two against her ribs. Keyes said that the gun was small, light and easy to conceal, but most of all it was quiet. He said, you could shoot someone on a busy street and no one would hear a thing. As Keyes was driving around town, he also told investigators that there was a police car right next to him at a red light, and he watched Samantha try and plan out her options. You could tell that he loved describing this, and you could tell the sense of power and control he got. Keyes thought about what he would do next. His 10-year-old daughter was probably asleep, but his girlfriend would still be awake, he told investigators. At some point whilst they were driving, Keyes realised Samantha didn't have her phone. He had bound her hands with the zip ties and gagged her in his truck and grabbed her phone from the kiosk. Keyes sent text messages to the people who had been calling her, one to her boyfriend and one to her boss. Text messages made it appear that Samantha just had a bad day and was leaving town for the weekend. Keyes then took the battery out of Samantha's phone. It was close to 2am when Keyes got the nerve to get Samantha out of the truck and walk her over to the shed in his backyard. Keyes asked Samantha for her debit card. Samantha told Keyes that she shared a bank account with her boyfriend and that his ATM card was in the truck that they shared. Samantha told Keyes where her house was and gave him the PIN number to the ATM card. Keyes put Samantha in the shed, bound her and turned the radio up so no one could hear her if she screamed. He also told her that he had the police scanner and would know if she had attempted to alert the neighbours. Keyes drove to Samantha's house and retrieved the ATM card from her truck. While he was at Samantha's, he was confronted by her boyfriend, who yelled at him and then went back inside the house to get help. Keyes ran back to his truck and left the area before he could be found. He drove to an ATM machine to test the PIN number provided by Samantha. He then returned to the shed. Keyes had sexually assaulted her and strangled her to death. He then woke up the next morning and went on a two-week cruise with his daughter, leaving her body in the shed. Keyes' girlfriend had no idea. Because of the freezing temperatures, Samantha's body was perfectly preserved. When he returned home, Keyes applied makeup to her face and sewed her eyes open with a fishing line. He then took a photograph of her body with a four-day-old issue of the Anchorage Daily News, maintaining the illusion that she was still alive and his ransom demanded. After demanding $30,000 in ransom, he texted a message directing the family to a dog park where the note could be found. Her family deposited some money from a reward fund. After taking the photo, he dismembered her body and dumped it in the Matanuska Lake, north of Anchorage. Whilst he was also at the lake, he said he caught some fish and brought them home and ate them. Police tracked withdrawals from the account as Keyes moved throughout the American Southwest. Keyes was arrested in Texas after using Samantha's debit card, which he had also previously used in Alaska, New Mexico, and Arizona. When Keyes used Samantha's debit card to get money from an ATM in Texas, the camera captured a picture of the rental car Keyes was driving, linking him to the card in murder. Keyes was arrested in Texas on March 16, 2012. Inside his car was an incriminating stash. There was rolls of cash and rubber bands, a piece of a grey t-shirt cut out to make a face mask, and a highlighted map with routes through California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The stolen debit card in Samantha Koenig's phone was also there. Keyes was taken back to Alaska where he confessed to the murder. He also confessed to many other crimes. 
The police had no idea that he was a serial killer when he was arrested. His trial was scheduled to begin in March 2013. Keyes also expressed his desire for a quick execution date. He said he dreaded sitting behind bars for years and didn't want his mother or daughter to suffer because of his crimes. In one last act of control, Keyes committed suicide in his Anchorage shell on the night of December 1st, 2012. Despite warnings not to provide Keyes with a razor blade, he had been given one. He slit his wrist and also strangled himself with a sheet while laying in bed. His body was not discovered until the morning of December 2nd. Underneath his body was a four-page suicide note, and he also left pictures of 11 skulls allegedly drawn using his own blood. The eerie images were found under his bed. Investigators believe the 11 skulls indicate his total number of murder victims, but only three have been confirmed so far. The note was soaked with blood and was hard to read. It was sent away to a FBI lab in Virginia. The note did not leave any hidden messages or important information. It was more like a poem about violence. Um.